Ah. Finally, this is just <coughs> just exciting every time whether the technology works, but hopefully we'll manage. Uh, Welcome back to, to my, my uh, part of this lecture series. I will talk about uh, logistics and supply chain management. Some of you may have been through some of this before, but uh, some of you may not. So I, we, from experience, we find it useful to, to take you through uh, this, uh, this introduction. And perhaps, and hopefully, we can have some discussions on, uh, on this. Um, so, um, the basis for, uh, sorry, is this the right one? This is not the right one. What has happened here? Introduction to international logistics or to logistics. We'll have more about international logistics on the on the next uh, next lecture. But uh, basically, it's uh, it's an introduction to logistics. Uh, what is logistics and what is the goal, the objective? Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, regional logistics assessment and more about that next time. Uh, and the role of transportation. And we'll talk about a bit about supply chain management and the differences between uh, logistics and supply chain management. And, and the reason why we focus on the difference is that um, the literature uses both terms. Uh, in various countries, if you are going to work uh, abroad somewhere, uh, the terms may be used in different ways. Um, in some countries, logistics means physical movements of goods, whereas uh, in other countries, logistics means more than that. It is more in, in, in the line with supply chain management, which is about uh, dealing with uh, corporations, uh, in, um, integration between companies, as we so, shall see later on. Um, so logistics may mean different uh, things in different countries. Uh, <coughs> we'll focus on uh, a bit, on the, uh, specifically on transportation's role in logistics in this uh, in this uh, course, of course, and uh, and uh, and. Um, why we need also to understand a bit about the workings of a supply chain when we deal with international transportation and distribution. Because uh, <coughs> transportation and distribution plays a very important role in uh, setting up global supply chains. Talk more about that next time. But, uh, but the principles and the differences will be the, will be the main, uh, main topic for this lecture. So, <clears throat> what is logistics? Um, a very simple definition is that uh, logistics is the job of getting things to where they need to be. <laughs> Physical movements. This is a classical definition. And it comprises not only products, cargo, but also people. You should, <coughs> you should bear in mind that when we talk about international transportation, we may also talk about international transportation of people, not only cargo. <coughs> and uh, so, so um, transport is a very important part of the service industry. 
and uh, and um, and hence uh, um, we need to talk about also uh, passenger transport in many cases when we deal with national transportation. Another definition is that logistics is that part of the supply chain that plans, implements and controls the efficient, eff effective flow and storage of goods, services and information from point of origin to point of consumption in order to meet cu customer requirements. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting uh, there is an, an interesting difference between those two definitions. In particular, and I'll talk more about that later on, it goes with the or in order to meet customer requirements. Because customer requirements can vary. And companies can use uh, logistics to earn money by providing a different level of service to the consumers uh, in terms of, for instance, um, offering products like if you are willing to pay $10 extra or 10 euros extra, you can have a given item or a given service tomorrow. If you are not willing to pay, it will take you a week to get it. And of course, as, as we shall see, it, it may be more, uh, more expensive to, to, for, a, for a supplier to provide fast transport of a good or, or a service. But you can still earn a markup, a profit, by, by offering, uh, by offering a, a higher level of service. You, 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 may, uh, you may, if you are in the market position to do that, you may uh, charge the customers uh, a price a bit higher than, than the costs, and then you, um, then you make money out of that uh, transaction. Um, <coughs> in, this, in this case, uh, in this, uh, this definition by the Council of Logistics Management comprises, at the outset, only products and cargo. Um, but you may uh, expand it also to comprise a service. Because when we talk about differences in, uh, in, uh, in delivery time of an item, like a computer or a cell phone or, or whatever, you are actually talking not so much about production products anymore, but you're talking about service. Um, so, so that is uh, that is uh, an important, uh, let's say, expansion of this uh, this rather narrow uh, scope. Um, <coughs> as I said, including the movement of people, uh, also I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, but the moving cargo is has its characteristics. Um, it's moving from one location to another whereas people makes round trips. Uh, so it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, modeling approach to, to, uh, to modeling cargo flows rather than, uh, than, than uh, flows of people. Uh, I'll come back to that in a later lecture. Um, cargo faces ownership issues. We'll have a, a separate guest lecture on, uh, on INCO terms on the 7th of November. Uh, Incoterms deals with, uh, among other things, the, the distribution of responsibility between uh, cargo owners, shippers, those who take care of, uh, of the transportation agreements, and the carriers, those who are doing the physical transportation. So it's, uh, it's of course of interest to, to, to know when you are transferring responsibility from one party in the transportation chain from A to B uh, to the next party. So when does, uh, when does uh, responsibility uh, change hands? It has to do with insurance 
and a lot of issues which will be dealt with on the 7th of, uh, of November. Supply chain management is, um, has a much wider scope. Um, it has to do with uh, coordination between different players that, n that is needed in a cooperative uh, sort of agreement or relationship to produce something. So <coughs> it's, uh, it's a strategic coordination, also tactical coordination of business processes functions across various players. Um, the main objective of, col of that kind of, uh, of uh, cooperation or collaboration between parties is of course to, to make more profit, to become more efficient. And if you are able to become more efficient, more productive, you may, you may uh, gain uh, a stronger market position. That's, I mean, that's common knowledge. But, uh, and there are lots of problems and challenges, very interesting challenges connected to such a, 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 such a let's say, a bunch of, uh, of companies working together to produce something. I'll come back to, to some of those issues uh, a bit later on. So, <coughs> you are, we are talking about the whole process from the, the, the origin of raw materials, ideally from the origin of raw materials, through the whole production process and to the end customer. And including also <coughs> end customers' need for repairs, aftermarket services, and uh, when, when the product reaches its end uh, of the life cycle, also recycling, returns, and so on. You can use one very simple example if you if you use this kind of uh, of uh, approach or consider your textbook or any any textbook in a supply chain management uh, perspective you can uh, formulate it like that uh, the raw materials are brought brought to the market by uh, by some forest owner who needs to chop the wood to, to make paper um, and refine paper into, into something that can be used for, uh, for printing. You need to print the text. You need to, uh, to bring the book to a wholesaler and finally to the bookstore upstairs or in the other building here. So this is a very simple step by step. Uh, we talk about upstream an upstream supplier which is the source of raw materials and we follow the river downstream until we reach the, the, the bookstore and finally US customers for, uh, furthest downstream in the supply chain but there are this is not the whole story about the supply chain like this is anything missing here you talk about what, what is needed to produce a book. Is this all? Maybe the customer? You need a customer. Customer is important. Without the customer, you don't have, uh, I, I mean, you don't have a market. And, uh, and, and you need that, of course. Other things? I would say that you need an author. Somebody should write the book. Um, if you look at the book, 
or if you look at, uh, at anything that you, are, that you want to buy, there is something called design. You need to design the book, you need to set the print, uh, the design of the print, the design of the, of the cover. You need the cover. You need somebody to provide the print shop with ink. You need, you need somebody to move <coughs> all, the, all the items between the various, uh, the various uh, let's say, players in this uh, simple supply chain. You need shippers to coordinate. You need carriers to, to do the physical transportation. You need somebody to do the marketing job and everything. If you think about it, it's rather complex. And, uh, and a lot of coordination is needed. I can give you one example. Um, that has to do with market and demand. Let's say that uh, a book is, uh, is ordered by, by, uh, by a bookstore and they see that uh, this, uh, this book doesn't sell very well. It may be a book that I have written, for instance. It doesn't sell very well. I mean, I, I wrote a book together with an English professor and, uh, and uh, year by year the royalties of that book doesn't cover the, the fee that I have to pay to the bank here in, in Molde to get it out. So that's that's level. But it, it has improved. It has improved. But you, I mean, uh, the bookstore, they just decided to cut the price to 50% of the, of, the, of the original retail, retail price. And what do they hope for? They hope for uh, increased sales, of course. And uh, what might happen, you never know, but what might happen is that the book suddenly hits the market and it starts to sell in buckets. What might be the problem is that the bookstore hasn't told anybody that they are going to do this. So they, are, uh, they, haven't, hasn't, they haven't told the wholesaler, they haven't told the print shop, and suddenly the shelves are empty. And sales are lost. That has to do with coordination. That has to do with information flow in the supply chain. The print shop <coughs> may be able to print. I mean, they have the, enough staff, they have enough paper, but they may have run out of ink because of this sudden increase in demand. So I will come back to this, but there is, there is uh, a lot of, of coordination that is, is needed here. So, uh, but the main message is that uh, you, need to, you need to have this information flow going to, to ensure that you have enough capacity, enough transport capacity and so on. Um, you may have, as I have indicated, uncertainty in demand. Suddenly somebody wants to, to run a campaign or you have a totally new product which nobody has seen before. Say a new, a new uh, let's say a very innovative uh, cell phone. You, n you don't know whether you will sell uh, 100 phones or whether you will sell, sell say, uh, 1,000 during the next half year or so. And, uh, and if you aggregate the numbers, uh, the manufacturer is, is, uh, has to, to cope with the very large fluctuations in demand or a very high uncertainty in demand. And then they need to set up agreements with, let's say, perhaps a a large number of companies that can produce some of the physical items in that phone. 
so that they can say that, well, if the, this phone hits the market, I can, I can use the agreements and call for extra production capacity. If, I, if, if, the, if the phone flops in the market, you don't use the agreements, but you need to pay something to have them, to, to, to have the option to, to, to call for more production capacity. Come back to this. Um, the development. I, I have now presented you with logistics, which uh, the classical definition is very is quite narrow. It's about moving uh, physical items, uh, whereas supply chain management is a more comprehensive concept, where you also include uh, you include planning, you include multiple player, players in the supply chain that needs to to share information and all that. Um, this has developed from uh, the 1960s, where you see that there was not much planning, or not much cooperation going on. Because you see, this is, these are business functions or business processes. And then the, uh, the situation was quite common that all these functions were taken care of by a very limited number of companies, or even the same company. So they had everything in-house. Uh, and then things started to, to, to uh, I mean, this, these, these business functions are still around. I mean, we do those, we need those functions to, to, uh, to produce something be it services or uh, products or, or whatever. But <coughs> one started to, to specialize, to, to, to make uh, different companies take care of uh, specific, uh, specific uh, processes, like these three, warehousing, materials handling, and, in, and packaging, for instance. And one started to split functions onto different companies, but then integrate operations between companies instead of between various departments or, uh, or divisions within, within one company. I, uh, <coughs> I grew up in a, in a town south of Oslo. They used to have a big shipyard. They used to have a big shipyard. And they did everything. I mean, they, they uh, did everything from uh, steelwork. Uh, I think they bought the engines, but, that, uh, but uh, apart from that, they made everything. They, uh, all the carpentry to make the interior of the ship, uh, the cranes, everything was made in-house. Uh, and you can think of what that may result in if something goes wrong. I mean, if the end customers disappear, if the market disappear, which actually happened through the 1980s in that town. A very large company with a lot of internal functions went bust. And you can think in terms of uh, Perhaps it would have been good to use the local carpenter or the local uh, welding company to buy the services, let them do the work on the, on the, uh, within the shipyard. But those companies could also do other things for other customers. And hence you, you, you have a kind of, of, of risk spreading. By, by, by organizing yourself in a way with more than one company, but they work together, but they are not necessarily tied up in one specific uh, part of the business. They may do other things as well. Uh, so that kind of, uh, of integration 
splitting on different companies and integration has moved on towards uh, our days in year 2013 but with more focus on uh, co um, cooperation between many companies especially when we talk about producing uh, complex uh, complex products and what has made this, uh, this possible is many things. It's culture, it's, uh, it's uh, the mindset of, uh, of people. Uh, but the main, let's say, scientific contribution to the understanding of when should companies cooperate and when should they integrate and becoming a, a, a company? When, when should functions be organized within a company? And when should functions be organized between companies? The contribution was made by a, 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 an economist con called Ronald Coase back in 1930 something, two or four. He died a couple of weeks ago, by the way. He got the Nobel Prize in Economics for his, uh, his work on the theory of the firm. And he, he did quite a lot on, uh, of, it was not, it is not, his work is not very difficult to read. I mean, you can read it. It's not technical, it's not mathematical. But it's a, it's a, it's a kind of reasoning around these, these uh, issues that was new at the time. And it took some, let's say, 50 years before it came into, let's say, practical use. Uh, when one started to think critically about what do you need inside my company and what can I buy for, from others. But it has evolved <coughs> into a, a rather, uh, let's say, structural thinking around uh, cooperation, about the costs of cooperation, and about uh, when do we need to organize in, in specific ways. So, <clears throat> what is the goal of logistics? And then we are back to a bit more on the physical movements side, which is, uh, which is what is, was this course is actually about. But I want to, I want also to, to talk quite a lot about supply chain management, which, uh, which is not only about, about physical movements, because physical movements plays a very important role when we, are, when we are setting up supply chains and make the decisions about whether to integrate, cooperate. Um, rapid response uh, is one, one, uh, one goal or one objective. You need to, to react quickly to changes or new developments. The extreme, perhaps, uh, the, the industry that is really at the front of being responsive and, uh, and uh, coming up with new, new products all the time is the, the cell phone industry. They, uh, they are pouring new phones uh, to the market uh, every week. Um, so, to, to be able to, to respond to, to uh, changes, or even to initiate changes by, by trying to find out what are the end customer's needs and trying to, or trying to also to, of course, influence what needs the end customers have in, uh, I mean, in the first place, is, is an important issue. But also, changes may also be about unforeseen circumstances. Like if, uh, if uh, some, uh, something happens to one of your suppliers, like this famous uh, 
fire in a in a in a microchip factory that served uh, Nokia and Sony Ericsson with uh, with microchips for their cell phones. Then the 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 buyer of those products, the microchip chips, they should should try to find out what are the risks if something goes wrong with one of my suppliers. Do I have a plan B to cope for that? And on, uh, on the transportation side, what happens if, if, my, uh, if uh, on the micro level, if a lorry breaks down with critical uh, items, what, what should I do then? And I, I uh, talked to a few carriers about their plans for, uh, or their abatement plans, if something went wrong. And uh, one of the big, rather big local, uh, local uh, carriers that, uh, that are uh, doing the transportation activities for one of the, one of the electromechanical uh, factories here in Molde, Brunvald. Uh, I asked them what, what happens if, if, you, uh, if, if a lorry breaks down. And they said, well, we have agreements. So at specific uh, places on the way from, uh, from uh, Europe and up to here, they have agreements with other companies so that they can, can, get, they can get another lorry if, if something happens. Um, so it is about also risk handling, not only uh, changes in market needs, but also changes on the supply side, if something goes wrong. Minimum variance, variance <coughs> that has to do with the uh, predictability of, uh, of products that are, uh, or, or deliverances, not only to the end customer, that, that you or I get, get our products when we have ordered them. But it's also about uh, buyer-supplier relationships in the supply chain. I mean, if the print shop is too late in getting the book to the market, uh, according to, to what, uh, the, the time that has been announced to the customers, sales may be lost. So, uh, so uh, that, is, uh, that is important. But you can also think, <coughs> also there in terms of, uh, of uh, trying to amend deviations if something happens. And that has to do with the information flow. If, uh, if a ship is delayed or, or, uh, or a train with, uh, with containers, cargo, is delayed, they should inform the customers about the delay. We had a fire two years ago on a rail link between uh, eastern and western Norway. There was a fire in a tunnel. So uh, a cargo train was stuck in that tunnel for, uh, for uh, some days. And the customers were waiting. And the problem was that nobody knew and actually, that's true. Nobody knew exactly what was uh, inside the containers. So we have a research project going on here at this college, as we speak, trying to, to develop systems to make it transparent what is actually on board a train going from, uh, from Oslo to Bergen. It sounds like, it sounds crazy. I mean, I, I didn't believe it in the first place. Why don't they have systems for that in place? But I don't. Somebody, knew, somebody knows, of course, what is in the containers. But, uh, but um, they lift the containers on board the train. And those who have packed the containers, they know what's in it. But there may be different players that pack the containers. So the whole train was, take, it was uh, departing from Oslo with a lot of containers. The contents of each of the containers were known, but nobody had the total view of whether 
a container was actually on that train, or if it was supposed to leave the next day on another train. So the track and tracing systems was not in place. I mean, inventory. Um, inventory is expensive and needs to be minimized. That is the traditional view. And I have added optimized. Because uh, if you read the literature, there is a strong focus on minimizing inventory costs. But is that true, necessarily, that you should minimize inventory costs? Could you think of situations where that is not true? It's, it's contraproductive to minimize inventory costs. If you have fluctuations in demand, if you have uh, what we call stochasticity in demand, you don't exactly know what is, what is uh, going to be demanded the next day or the next week, you may want to not minimize but optimize. You would need to have some, something in stock to, to cater for the variance in, in demand. And in an, in an ideal world where everything is known and everything is de deterministic, you can minimize. But the world is not always like that, or it is, <laughs> it is normally not like that. So we need to have some kind of, because inventory is kind of slack in the system, to be able to, 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 um, to serve the end customer's needs without stockouts, which can be very expensive. So, also, it's a trade-off between keeping inventory and, and uh, suffering from stockout costs. Uh, movement consolidation. Um, transport costs can be reduced by consolidating many small shipments into bigger and less frequent ones. Seems fair enough, but it, is it always like that? Is it always a good strategy? Um, it depends on the type of cargo. That goes back to what I, I talked about, this uh, level of service in, in delivery, in speed of delivery. You could think that uh, goods shipped in large quantities with a very stable demand uh, and not many possibilities to, to differentiate the delivery speed. I mean, uh, let's say an everyday sweater like this, which are shipped in, in large quantities. Um, I, that might be a good strategy. But for other more time-critic uh, commodities, like uh, the extreme might be, uh, be important medicines, for hospitals and so on. You may not want to delay. You may want to take the costs and, and, uh, and get the shipments done right away. So this is not, I mean, you meet such statements in the literature, but it may not always be the full truth. Quality. Not only products, but also the logistics services need to conform to quality standards. That may not, uh, I mean, I can accept that statement as it stands, but you may, may want to reflect uh, a bit upon that as well. Because uh, quality standards may, may be different among different customer groups. I mean, you can just uh, take a look at the car market for cars, where I just needed to check the, the clock here, where, where uh, some market segments can live with lower quality standards. And other market segments. You have premium cars, you have uh, 
ordinary car you have, you have perhaps not the so good cars but uh, somebody wants those as well because they are cheap so the highest quality according to end customer needs is the key here life cycle support is another uh, function that needs to be cared of uh, within, the, in, in, within logistics. Return products, maybe complaints, uh, defective products, or uh, recycling of uh, products that has ended their, have ended their uh, life cycle. And that has an increased attention, have gotten an increased attention over the years, the, the recycling thing because it has to do with uh, waste management and, uh, re and reuse of, uh, of scarce resources. Okay, um, I think we try to break uh, for 15 minutes and then I will start at quarter past this time, I think, hopefully. Okay.
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> then we continue. Um, well, the, some of this uh, can be be summarized in an illustration like this. You have um, again the, the main point of departure is the end customer needs here. So we have the, the right products, the right quantity, uh, delivered at the right moment at minimal costs. <coughs> and then um, uh, flexibility has to do with uh, being able to cope with, with some with changes. Uh, I have, we discussed that uh, a bit uh, on the previous slide. Flexibility, <coughs> that has to do with, let's say, optimizing the necessary inventory level. But it may also have to do with making the production process flexible. Uh, because you may be in a situation where you have products with uh, different, uh, let's say, variants of the same product. You can design a computer with some common components, like the main, the main board, the motherboard, and then you have different specifications of uh, storage capacity, processor capacity, uh, the amount of memory, and so on and so forth. And then, you can actually, if something happens, let's say that you, you uh, for some reason, you run out of a specific, let's say, type of, uh, or, uh, of memory capacity. You can then use the price mechanism to make the end customers demand another part or another product in your product portfolio. So that is also one, one, one kind of flexibility that can be established to hedge against market fluctuations. And also if something, uh, if some, something happens to one of your suppliers. There is a, a well-known story about Dell computers that ran out of, uh, of flat screens some years ago because uh, there were some problems with the supplier. And then they used the, the price mechanisms. Price mechanism to give discounts on another product that could serve almost the same purpose, and then managed to keep their market share. The right quantity has to do with, um, with reliability in, in delivery. Uh, reliability is important. There is, there is a difference between reliability and time. Because you may have short delivery time. If the, if the reliability is, is bad, meaning that there is a big variance in whether you get it within one day or three days or four days or two days, that may be very, very bad. Uh, then it's perhaps better to say that we can deliver within three days and then you can uh, actually keep your promises instead of promising two days and have a big variance because of the of, uh, characteristics in the transport system or, or whatever. Uh, <coughs> the right moment, that has to do with delivery time, also lead time in, in, uh, in production. Um, minimal costs, well, again, minimal costs given the preferences of the, mar of your, your, uh, of, of the end customers and the market segments among the end customers. Um, inventory level is mentioned as one source of minimizing costs, but there are many, many others. And if you are going to, to dig deeply into the, the logistics profession, you will find a lot. Like 
choice of suppliers, uh, purchasing routines. It may be about um, replenishment cycles. How often you 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 order supplies has to do with inventory level. Um, it may have to do with uh, with transportation. It may have to do with production, production setup, production cycles. It may have to do with the product design, as I mentioned. <coughs> you can design a product uh, or a, or a components to to uh, be able to offer a large product variety to the market, which is normally a good thing. <coughs> so there are lots of. Uh, Lots of issues that, that minimizes costs. But we haven't talked that much about coordination, cooperation, many companies, few companies in-house or, uh, or uh, buying from other companies and so on. This is perhaps, or this is more focused on the, on the process and not so much on who carries out the processes. A few key terms, materials management, it's good to have <coughs> a definition of some of the key terms that you will come across in the literature. Materials management, what the company does with its inputs, how it acquires materials, how they are handled and how they are shipped out of the factory. That is a flow of materials. Physical distribution, it's what we are <coughs> mostly dealing with in this course. Uh, how to move the products uh, to the market um, and also, I mean, if you are observing a supply chain, uh, what is distribution from one of the players in the supply chain to the next link in the supply chain? Is, uh, is its outbound or outbound physical distribution for one player? Maybe inbound, uh, may, may of course be the inbound flow for, another, for the next link or the next player in the supply chain. <coughs> the, the, uh, when I'm talking about next, it's the next player downstream in the supply chain. Uh, business logistics, <coughs> here we are approaching supply chain thinking. Integrating more ad, uh, administrative uh, functions like financing, uh, like marketing, onto the more physical part uh, like transportation, uh, warehousing, and so on. A decision on transportation will, of course, have financial effects, and uh, and uh, business logistics and the to be conscious about how a transportation decision may influence all the parties that are involved in the, in the process is, uh, is what this is, uh, this is about. On the first lecture, if you remember, I mentioned this um, case where uh, the credit crunch, the global credit crunch caused shippers to, to uh, consolidate containers, to fill the container ships. And that took a lot of time because the demand dropped. And that had, of course, financial effects on the customers that were uh, was supposed to receive this, these supplies, perhaps as a part of their production processes. That is one example. Integrated logistics, <coughs> then we are taking uh, yet another step towards supply chain management. Uh, involves the activities of suppliers and customers as well. Let's come back to that. Operations. Um, <coughs> like that is a kind of would you can you can consider it as a transformation of a product 
or a service from one stage to another. When you, when you, uh, when you move something from A to B, you transform um, a given product from one state to another by adding components or doing uh, any kind of production process. That is also what is encompassed by operations. If you are, uh, <coughs> if you are training your staff, that is also an operation in, in, in according to this definition. Inbound logistics has to do with sourcing, material management. So what is outbound by one by the upstream player in the supply chain is inbound by the down, downstream, the next player downstream. Operational log logistics <coughs> um, emphasizes the way logistics affects operations. It's um, like, for instance, if you think of products in terms of modules that can be changed to, to increase product variety. That is an example of that, as I mentioned. This is goes without saying. Uh, logistics within the firm and between firms. Between firms is, of course, the the core of, uh, of supply chain uh, management and uh, or supply chain, yes, supply chain management and uh, the, how you perform logistics between firms will or may affect the logistics within the firm. It's, it's, it's simple, I mean, if, if you have problems with, uh, with, uh, with some kind of transportation activity between companies, that will or may cause steps to be taken internally to cope for any delay or something. It is a simple example. You need to call out people to unload a container during nighttime because of a delayed arrival. Entails costs and, uh, and everything. Yes, international logistics, we'll talk more about that next time. But uh, it causes some extra or additional challenges. It causes some uh, some risks that are not the, that are not necessarily in place if you if you consider a, a national or domestic uh, log, log, chain of logistics operations. Culture and dif are different, and, and and so on. We'll come back to that. And here you see the <coughs> what I started out with that. Uh, in some European countries, like France, logistics are interpreted at, as, uh, as uh, more operations management, management of flows. If you, if you drive ar uh, along a highway in Europe, you will see lots of trucks with the name logistics and some company name on, on, on the side of it. That is movement. Whereas uh, in, uh, in Japan, logistics are more interpreted as integrated logistics or, if you like, supply chain management. So I'm just, <coughs> I'm just talking a bit about this because when you are supposed to read, read articles and if some of you are going, on, going further on to, to a master's in, uh, in logistics or operations management somewhere in the world, uh, you will come across various use of these terms. Um, <coughs> trends in logistics spendings, a few words about that. Uh, some, some numbers. Uh, in the United States, 10% of the price of all goods are attributed to the cost of logistics. In terms of uh, movements of cargo uh, or products, components, and also the transaction costs connected to that. And the uh, transaction costs are, uh, that is actually a complex issue. And transaction cost analysis is a spe uh, specific field within economics where a lot of research is done. But the simple, <coughs> the most simple transaction cost is, let's say, what you pay for, uh, for supplies and uh, including transportation 
from from the from the supplier to the buyer, if you are a customer to to you as a customer. But then, in addition to that, you may have costs connected to monitoring that the supplier is actually doing what uh, what the supplier is supposed to do, that you get the right product according to to your specifications. Um, in some cases where there is a high complexity in the product that you are going to buy from somebody, you may need to work with the supplier to develop, let's say, or uh, adapt the product to your needs, which is increasing the transaction costs. So then you are not only paying for the product and the transportation activity, but you are also paying in terms of time and efforts and perhaps some investments to, to, uh, to work with your supplier to get the complex product uh, to the market. The offshore, or offshore oil and gas industry is one example where there is a, a rather uh, dense collaboration between buyers and suppliers in many cases, when you are talking about engineering to order production. Whereas in situations where you can more or less buy products or supplies off the shelf, they are already made. You don't need to adapt them to, to anything. They are just to plug and play, so to speak. Then the tr transaction costs are limited to, uh, to the transportation, the cost of the product, and also perhaps, uh, I mean, invoicing and all that practical stuff connected to the, to the transaction. Perhaps not much more than that. Especially if there is a competitive market with many suppliers that can offer you the, the product, it goes, uh, the transaction costs are, are modest. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about international logistics, they, they vary quite, quite a lot. And I'll show you one, one slide showing why uh, international logistics can, on, and the cost of that can be very, very high. Um, yeah. Logistics spending seems to be going down, uh, but the picture is mixed because customers, at least in periods, with, periods with, where the global economy is, uh, is, uh, is in a good state of affairs, customers may demand, for instance, fast deliveries, which may, uh, may entail the use of air freight, which is expensive. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as the customer is willing to pay the price. Uh, so this is not, this is uh, in terms of regular deliveries, the customers want it. And c a different story is if you need to use air freight because somebody has, uh, has, uh, has not perhaps done, done their job properly. So you need to use air freight as an emergency to get the product uh, because of some delay or something that has happened in the, in the, in the supply chain or in the, in the production of the good. Then we are talking about, th th that's another story. The level of econo economic activity and trade, as we saw in, during the, the last lecture, trade is of course affecting logistics costs. Lower production prices in, in other countries, uh, the use of their comparative advantages, to ship their products to, to, to another country and vice versa, increases uh, logistics costs. Efficiency in the logistics systems, of course. Um, and also a shift from the demand of goods towards services. I mean, and the simple example is when prosperous 
people in rich countries have gotten all that they they have just they need one car per person and you need one dishwasher per per house per unit and so on. You have all the items that you need. You will shift your demand more towards uh, services, domestic services, or you may simply want to to travel more, which is a, a, a defined as a service. You need you, you demand more uh, more transportation to get from to to, to pa places where you want to spend your holidays and so on. So, <coughs> in a way, uh, this shift is driven by uh, by um, by pros prosperity, by by the income level and the level uh, the, the level of uh, of wealth in in different uh, different countries. This is just, uh, I didn't manage to get any new number numbers than 2005. Uh, this shows uh, very simply the, from, from the US. Uh, I will show you some Norwegian numbers and also some uh, international comparisons uh, afterwards. And, and uh, this says something about the total spendings. And you can say, well, okay, that's, that's interesting, but so what? Because you have the, it's not indexed, but you have the, the, the absolute numbers in, in, in billions, um, billion dollars per year from 1981 and, and onwards. Uh, and those are in real numbers, so we can compare in, in that respect. What you see here is that inventory carrying costs, the lower line here is not it hasn't grown that much over the years. But transportation has grown quite significantly. Administrative costs is more or less constant here. So, <coughs> what does this tell us? Because, okay, you can say that, well, it's, um, of course, the activity level has increased over this uh, 20 plus year period. Except that, you can see some changes, some increase in, in uh, inventory carrying costs and administrative costs. But it says something about uh, the relationship between transport and inventory holding. What is that? It's simple, rather simple. It's more focus on um, perhaps smaller shipments. It may be more focus on on uh, on just in time deliveries, less than full truck loads. Um, so, the transportation activities and the transportation part of, uh, of, of the logistics activities has increased in volume. The growth in transportation has increased. Um, whereas uh, inventory keeping and, and has not increased that much. So, this is a, you can observe a kind of a change shift from uh, from uh, traditional inventory holding full full truck loads to a more a bit more just in time less than full truck loads uh, shipments as an economist i would call this a kind of an income elastic phenomenon because as we get richer we get more, <laughs> I'm, I'm simplifying a bit now, but, but we become a bit more impatient. We want things right away. And that has a rather significant influence of, uh, on, on transportation and the transport volumes. And there is a discussion going on these days, and there are large research programs actually going on as we speak to try to decouple 
the link between economic growth and the growth in, uh, in, in transportation, physical transportation. And uh, there has been efforts made to, to, to uh, organize smarter distribution. And then we will, uh, we will turn to that uh, later on in the course with, uh, with, let's say, how we organize ports and terminals, cross-docking activities where we can, can uh, fill a truck or a train with different products to different customers. And even if people dem or the end customers demand fast deliveries, we can still be able to, to have a, 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 as high capacity utilization as possible by combining uh, various shipments and try to, to, to fill, fill the ships, fill the trains, fill, fill the trucks and still be able to, to have a kind of a just-in-time-ish uh, distribution system. And then, <coughs> um, regional logistics assessments. We are dealing with international transportation and distribution here. We'll talk a bit more about this next time. But there are some factors that needs to be addressed um, when we are going to, to set up services or activities in other countries. Um, geography plus factors could be uh, ports, natural, natural ports, good overland uh, access, roads, rail, uh, which is valid for USA and the most of Europe. Minus factors are uh, mountains, fjords, this county, Norway. No access to ports, which is uh, much more of a problem in Africa than in Europe. There are some landlocked uh, European countries, but there are many more landlocked countries in Africa and they have significant problems with, uh, with their inland logistics. Physical infrastructure, <coughs> and then we are talking about uh, the transport infrastructure. Uh, this is important. Modern businesses requires predictability. You need to know the rules, and you, know, you need to know that the rules are understood in a common way uh, by, by the trade partners. So that, and this affects reliability. It affects costs, of course, but it affects reliability. So, I mean, variance in the transportation times are normally much more expensive for the end customers. They, they, they want to avoid uh, variance. As I said uh, earlier, they can live with a predictable and perhaps a bit longer uh, time of delivery, but I want to avoid the variance. And this, if you, <coughs> if you don't cope properly with, uh, with the legal and business infrastructure in different countries, the variance can be enormous. I have studied <coughs> a bit, uh, published together with a colleague a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a paper on the Northern Sea route between uh, Europe and Asia, going north of Russia. Because of the um, ice melting, you can now uh, carry cargo w with ships north of Russia. It's much shorter than going via S the Suez Canal or, uh, or around Africa. Much, much shorter. There are some limitations uh, <coughs> due to shallow waters and things like that, but, uh, but for, uh, for adequate vessels it's much shorter and you can save a lot of money and time on that. But then <coughs> you need to cope with the legal system in, in Russia and, and, uh, and the politics. 
and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to to put any blame on Russia, but but uh, it's it's a matter of fact that the politics and the legal system has been a bit more, let's say, difficult to to interpret than uh, than uh, than the legal system in, in in Western Europe. So things can be very much delayed if agreement, proper agreements are not made beforehand. You may have to wait for three weeks to get an icebreaker at your disposal to get your ship through this corridor. Not because the ice is a problem, but because the, the legislation tells you that you need an icebreaker as an escort to take a ship through this northern sea corridor. And then the story was, there is a story about, the, and this is true, last year a Chinese icebreaker wanted to use that corridor to go to, uh, to the northern Atlantic. And they were allowed to do so, but they needed to be escorted by a Russian icebreaker. Political system, is, uh, I've talked more, uh, enough about that, I think, but you need to, you need to cope with that. This is an example <coughs> of a very simple analytical scheme that can be used to address some of the issues that I, or, or at least the consequence of some of the issues that I mentioned. This is an example of a cost time profile for an inland shipment from Mombasa, which is a, a port down on the southeastern part of Kenya here, and up to Nairobi. And uh, you may want to uh, consider, uh, if you are going to ship a product to, to Nairobi, or if you are going to plan for, uh, for transportation activities, you may, you may, for instance, uh, have um, a perishable product that you are going to ship from Kenya to Europe. They grow a lot of flowers in Kenya that you can buy here in Molde, for instance. And you need to plan, because flowers, they tend to not want to be on the road for very many weeks, at least. So, the distance between these two cities are around 400 kilometers. And then you have the time. Because when you talk about perishables, time is the most critical factor. So you can sit down, collect data, and set up a very simple time cost time profile. Start here in Mombasa. And you can assign the operations and the time needed to carry out the operations. Three hours for a weight station to weigh your vehicle, to be able to ensure that it, is, uh, that it can uh, cope with the roads, the road standard. And then you have over a distance of some uh, 300 kilometers, you have a number of police checks along the road, which is a part of the legislation. And you have other driver delays. And you need, of course, if you're going to try to streamline this transport chain, you need to address what are the causes of these delays. But you can say that this is a first order analysis. And those of you who are, who are uh, <laughs> still awake, you can see that there is, a, there is something wrong here, because from four and up to 11 hours. That should be uh, around five hours, right? The here is said 13. So the scale here is, is not good. But just forget about that. The point here is that during this 300 kilometers transport, there are some issues. 
connected to uh, to to delays and disruptions in the transport chain. And then you have a new weight station, and then <coughs> you you move a, a little bit, not too uh, not too time consuming, and then you have unloading. So this is a description of the components time-wise in this, uh, in this uh, transport chain of uh, 430 kilometers, takes 30 hours. And then you have a breakdown of, uh, of, the, uh, of the costs. And you see that around 45% is connected to delays. And then you have a case for, uh, for addressing this issue if you're going to set up a business transporting flowers from, uh, from Kenya to Norway or to Europe. Try to, to work out how you can come around this, this, uh, these problems. You see that uh, <coughs> clearing agent fees and so on is 15%. Um, there are, uh, no sorry, that is the shipping lines. Here are the clearing agents, which is a small fraction. Sea freight shipping, which is the main, uh, which is the main part, and this is this is a case where uh, something is taken to the United States, not to Europe. The sea freight is is not a very big cost. Port handling is not a very big cost. Shipping line <laughs> charges is uh, is. Uh, is uh, probably connected to some inla inland shipping, 15%. Uh, container freight station charges, and so on. But you see that the, the big issue here is delays. No rocket science, not, nothing difficult. But it's, uh, if you are in some point in, in the future, if you are going to write a master's thesis on perhaps streamlining a, 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 a transport chain from, from some country to another, this is a good place to start <coughs> to address where you should put your efforts to, to streamline this, uh, this flow. The performance cycle is another key issue. Um, this is simply uh, the activities that takes place from when the re demand is, is recognized or if you like the order is placed <coughs> and then on to uh, when the payment is collected. That is the performance cycle from order, reception of order and to the to the reception of payments, actually. So <coughs> you can break down them into four, four main categories. Uh, documentation, communication, and flat traction, those are parts of the same story. Uh, <coughs> but transaction, as I mentioned, when I talked about transaction costs, is a much more comprehensive topic than just documentation and communication. Because that has to do with how parties in the supply chain may integrate, depending on the nature of the product. And that may also in, uh, involve transportation. Because, uh, <coughs> well, I mentioned this, um, this uh, transport company that served one of the bigger company, uh, production companies in Molda here. They have, in a way, they haven't integrated, they are two separate companies, but they have, in a way, uh, joined forces to develop uh, special carriers to carry some of the heavier items. On, uh, on, on the road. So <coughs> and that has, of course, involved some investments and some time to develop things. 
So, so transaction is much more than just handing over money or sending invoices and documentation and things like that. It's also about how you cooperate. And then production and distribution. So <coughs> the, the main goal or objective is to, to, to um, produce according to specifications. Perfect is in a way a, a, a term that, as I have talked about, it depends on the needs of the end customer. What is actually the meaning of perfect can, can vary among market segments. Uh, but also in terms of being able to cope with disruptions, mistakes. And that is not trivial, because um, if you remove every slack in a, in a chain, in a value chain or supply chain, mistakes can cause a lot of problems, because everything is geared towards seamless production. And when something happens and you don't have any any inventory, any kinds of, of slack in the system, you may have, uh, you may uh, face high, very high costs of fixing the problem. Uh, so that is also part of, of the performance cycle to, to be able to cope with the deviations, disruptions. The role of transportation in 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 uh, in the, as part of logistics here. Um, there are various players in the transportation chain. You have the shipper, the company that controls the freight, arranging the transportation, uh, setting up uh, the services. It could be the owner of the cargo, but it could also be the container. Let's say a, a third-party logistics provider that takes care of everything from from it leaves the when it leaves the the factory and until arrival at the end customers. The carrier. We'll talk about uh, the various types of carriers, various transport modes throughout the course. Uh, land, be it road or rail, sea and the air. And you may also have intermodal transportation we use more than one mode. You use ship and truck, for instance. And you may have a choice between <coughs> land transport and sea transport. You may have a choice between rail or road transport, if you are only considering land transport. Uh, within the country, domestic transports, and between countries. And um, there is a discussion going on about how to transfer more cargo from road to rail or sea. Uh, and the main reason for that has to do with uh, emissions, energy use. And we'll deal with that uh, later on in course, because that causes some very interesting uh, challenges, also academically, to analyze that and to, uh, to cope with it in, in, uh, in, uh, in the real-world uh, situations. The consignee is the entity that receives the cargo. Um, exporter, importer. And in many cases, these, the shipper and the consignee is a part of the same company. They, they do both kinds of operations both importing and exporting uh, the, the, all the formal procedures connected to that is taken care of by one player, not two. And they, <coughs> let's say if, the, if you have a big, you have a big third party logistic provider taking care of, of these two functions, they, they uh, normally buy transport services from, from, uh, from independent transport companies. Which makes sense, because there is a big difference in setting up a company for handling legal issues, 
uh, warehousing issues uh, and so on uh, and taking care of the physical transportation. It's, the, it's a big difference in production processes and it may, I don't say that it is always the case, but it may not be a very good reason for integrating shipping consignee functions with, with the carrier functions. Often you see some of the big uh, transport companies like uh, Schenker, Kynenagel and others. A lot of trucks with their logos on the side. But if you look carefully, you will see a small logo on the tr truck which gives a different company name. And that is the name of the carrier, which is an independent company that are are in a contractual relationship with one of the big big 3PLs like uh, Schenker or, uh, or Kuhn-Nagel or others, DHL. So <coughs> we are dealing with some special challenges. Uh, this will be dealt with on the 7th of November. This will be dealt with later on in the course, intermodal transportation and the longer distances causing challenges with respect to risk and so on. Things that may happen on the way. Okay, we break again. If there are no questions, you are a silent bunch of people, I must say. But uh, I can understand that it's, uh, it's starting to get late in the, in the day here. Okay, break until 15. Post.
Which are here?
Okay, we'll uh, Okay, let's start again. Last mile, so to speak. Um, moving on a bit to okay uh, <laughs> to supply chain. Um, then, as I said, it's uh, it's uh, a sequence of uh, suppliers or players that contribute to the creation and delivery of a good, uh, and uh, the management of this <coughs> is to to manage the integration of, uh, of business processes from the upstream uh, supplier and downstream to the end user. Uh, and uh, the idea is that this chain should provide uh, operations, products, services, information that add value. If you don't manage to do that, <coughs> then, uh, then because it's, it's the value for the end customer that is a driver for this system. So <coughs> it consists of, uh, of uh, upstream raw material ma manufacturers, intermediate manufacturers, in many industries you have that, in computer industry, in cell phone industry, car industry, the final product manufacturers, which may be um, manufacturing complex products from uh, a very, let's say, low level and up to a high level of refinement. And you may have assemblers that assemble uh, intermediate products together and, and, uh, and uh, deliver to the, to the market. You have wholesalers, distributors, transport companies and, and retailers connected by, by, uh, by physical movements and, uh, and uh, storage in inventory activities. 
Uh, the integration, as I've said, information is and the information flow is, is vital here. Uh, and without the information flow, it's difficult to have uh, planning and integration activities in place. Uh, enterprise resource planning systems, ERP systems, are used as a means for coordinating uh, the business processes across uh, the, the supply chain. Uh, <coughs> many, and as I said, many large firms are moving away from these in-house vertically integrated structures, as we saw on, the, on the, one of the first slides. That was a common pattern in the, back in the 60s and 70s. And to breaking up Many companies uh, are, uh, are uh, taking play, play part in the production process. And in some cases, we see a, a reversal of this, that uh, we have some what we might call home shoring, that companies are taking strategic operations back in-house again. And the reason for that Maybe uh, there may be many reasons, but one of them is that if taking uh, taking uh, operations back in house, they may cause they may create a larger strategic distance towards their competitors. That sounds pretty theoretic, but if you, you think in terms of uh, let's say designing products. Uh, there have been examples when, uh, when shipbuilders have outsourced design to a consultant. What happens then? The consultant, consultancy may do an excellent job in designing ships. The problem with an independent consultant is that they may transfer the ideas on to other shipbuilders. So the flow of, uh, let's say, competitive or uh, information that is sensitive to, to your competitive position as a shipbuilder may flow in directions that you may not want it to flow because it may benefit your competitors. So this specific shipyard, which is located in this county, back or insourced this design function again to avoid uh, too, too much spreading of knowledge in that respect. Another cause of, of insourcing may be that uh, production costs, if you, if you move your production from, uh, from a high cost country to a low cost country, you may get quality problems. And uh, the, uh, in the international the theory of international economics may start to work, giving an equilibrium between the high cost and the low cost country, where wages are starting to creep up in the low cost country, and perhaps they are starting to level out in the high cost country. Then it becomes less attractive to have the production outsourced. So there is a, there are a trend now. There is a trend now that. Uh, some types of production are, are back sourced from, uh, from low cost countries and back to the high cost countries. It happens here, and it happens in the United States, and uh, probably in other countries as well. Actually, General Electric, a big uh, manufacturer of, uh, of uh, electric equipment for domestic use, dishwashers, and uh, what what have you, they are now starting production in or backsourcing production to the, to the United States. Because they, they gain better control, <coughs> they may over the production process and they may use uh, new technologies in a more efficient way in their, uh, let's say, neighborhood, the vicinity than they are able to do if, if the production facility is on the other side of the globe. That, of course, influences 
growth in international transportation. So this is a conceptual illustration of, uh, of a supply chain uh, where you have the, the raw material suppliers upstream on the left hand side. You may have inter intermediate component manufacturers which buys the raw materials. They sell the intermediate components to the manufacturer which may be the end product manufacturer. We call it often a focal firm in this supply chain where you have suppliers, you have supplier suppliers here, you have wholesalers on this side and the end customers, retailers and end customers in various, uh, let's say, levels depending on the, on the specific supply chain. Uh, here transport and storage activities comes into play when you're going to move something physically from one location to another. You need information planning activity integration across these players for reasons that I have, uh, have uh, talked a bit about already. I mentioned this example where when, when the retailer uh, is deciding to drop prices to increase sales, you need to have that aligned with I mean, it's, uh, it's not a good thing to get uh, empty shelves because they, these people haven't got the message that production is going to be increased. Um, <coughs> this is uh, fairly simple and, uh, and of course uh, in, in real life very complicated. Um, it's also worth noting that intermediate component manufacturers, for instance, they have their own supply chain where they, are, uh, where, where they are the focal firm. So we have actually a network at work here, where uh, in addition to having the raw material suppliers aimed at this specific production, they also need other supplies like uh, power, like housing, like people, everything, which needs to be, uh, be, be taken care of. And in that supply chain, these are the focal firm and correspondingly on the, on the other side here. The wholesalers, they also need a lot of, of uh, uh, inputs or supplies to perform their business, uh, which makes them the focal firm in, uh, in, in, their, in their own supply chain. But, and as I said, if you're going to study this further, um, this discipline of, uh, of supply chain management, you will come across many very interesting challenges with respect to interplay between links or, or com uh, components in the supply chain, depending on the nature of the product, depending on the risk profiles, and depending on what changes that can be made. Like for instance, if, uh, if a new <coughs> transportation link opens up and which may shift the transport flow between, let's say, Eastern Asia and Europe, the United States. As I mentioned, this, uh, this uh, corridor north of Russia which uh, you may imagine that that may uh, affect uh, warehousing, inventory keeping, uh, it may affect where you locate your production, where you choose to source your, uh, your components from and so on. So if, you, if you introduce a new transport link, of course the, the primary effect is reduced transport costs, but that may also actually influence <coughs> the way you set up your supply chain. Where you choose to source from, it may even affect where you choose to sell your products because new markets may open up. Yeah, this is uh, again uh, a very uh, quite standardized uh, definition and it's a bit idealistic if you read it. I mean, 
the effectiveness of the whole supply chain is more important than the effectiveness of each individual department. Okay, so you're going to satisfy your customers and it can be interpreted as, at, as if at the same time you should give up some of your demands for profit if somebody else in the supply chain will gain more from being a member of the supply chain, then you have to suffer from, from being a member of the same chain. Sounds a bit fluffy. I can give you one example. Uh, in Stockholm, <coughs> in Sweden, they um, tried to coordinate the urban distribution of goods in Stockholm. So they tried to merge, not uh, by means of uh, getting different uh, distributors to, to join forces in the same company, but to be a member of the supply chain. And the objective was to increase the capacity utilization of the companies and to, to uh, as a system, uh, gain or earn more profits. And the system as a whole came out in, a, in such a way. But some of the smaller distributors, they lost money from entering into this, uh, this relationship. Whereas the big ones, they were able to, to utilize their economies of scale and to gain more profits than they used to, to have in the first place before they entered this, uh, this uh, collaboration. And uh, they had no contractual relationship where they were able to split prof profits so that the smaller ones could also gain from this at the expense of the bigger ones. So the whole thing broke down. And then they, uh, continu uh, they continued as before with a with rather low capacity utilization and uh, the system as a whole did not make s uh, such high profits as they, they did in, the, in this, uh, this collaboration. So it break, broke down. So to <coughs> you need to translate this into something like you should have a, a you should set up this uh, as a as a unified collaboration with respect to the incentives that each player gets. There must be something in it for everybody. So this is this is way too idealistic. You need to specify the contract so that everybody gains from from a, from a membership. And if somebody loses, they should be compensated so that, uh, that the system as a whole can still be, uh, be, be better off than if they are acting as, sep as separate uh, entities. And that was the main, uh, let's say, problem with the, with the Swedish uh, urban distribution experiment, that they didn't have this, uh, this uh, perspective of uh, profit sharing. This is also something that you see in the literature. And I have put it up there because it's a kind of a buzzword. That you have a, a change in market competition from brand versus brand to supply chain versus supply chain. It's uh, I cited a scientific paper saying that. It's in a textbook by, uh, by a professor, Martin Christopher, from Cranfield University, saying the same thing. Um, and I don't agree. Because you have still the competition. You don't compete supply chain versus supply chain. You still compete brand versus brand, as you have always been doing. I mean, uh, Dell computers are competing against Compaq or Hewlett Packard or whatever. But behind the brands, you have various uh, supply chain approaches which needs to be addressed and you need to have 
uh, you need to have a, a, you are competing of course in terms of having a productive supply chain and being better than your competitor in having a productive supply chain. But you are still competing brand wise. I mean you don't buy <coughs> a product from a supply chain, you buy it because it is a brand. Uh, well, this is uh, something that I mentioned already. Uh, this is also what I have uh, been touching upon from products cost minimization towards this integration of, uh, of supply chain in, in, bigger, in bigger collaborations. Uh, where you have one focal firm that takes care of the, of the co coordination activities. The car industry is working like that, where they have a very strong focus on supplier relationships and customer relationships. But that is a, a type of production where you have modules, you have assembly lines, and, uh, and, uh, and manufacturing based on large quantities of products. The other extreme is, uh, let's say, the big oil and gas companies that is extracts oil from the seabed outside the, the, the coastline here or in the Mexican Gulf or wh wherever. But they are the focal firm ordering high-tech equipment from their suppliers and working closely with them in research and development of such uh, items. Produced in a limited number, but with a lot of suppliers involved in the production. And in a high, at least at times, a very high degree of vertical coordination and integration between suppliers and, uh, and the focal firm. They have common information systems, common ERP systems to, to plan the production process and so on. Whereas uh, the car industry has, uh, has a, let's say, a, a weaker, a weaker uh, vertical integration between the um, car maker and the suppliers. And that also varies <coughs> um, between, between countries and between cultures. Japanese car makers are much more integrated with their suppliers than the, uh, the American and European car makers are. But the production philosophy <coughs> is also influencing this, uh, this, uh, this transportation business within these supply chains. When, uh, when you have an, a production based on just-in-time, lean thinking, uh, let's say car makers, they are, uh, at least some of them, they demand their suppliers to be located next door. And that, sh that was a shift that happened some 10, 10 to 15 years ago. And of course, if you, if you, uh, if you get that philosophy that you need to be located on the spot next door so that you can just roll the supplies on, on, on the more or less on the shop floor into the directly into the production that affects transport planning international transport planning so um, and that has also been uh, been the situation in Europe that uh, car makers are, are demanding a very close geographical uh, location between the, the, the production facility and the suppliers. Yeah. Changes in uh, supply chain management thinking. I've talked about outsourcing. I've talked about uh, the demand side here, the need for, uh, for speed, flexibility, and, and of course, uh, competitive pricing. Um, this has allowed for new ways of, uh, of, of collaborating. Where, as I said, some focal firms are taking very large steps in, 
demanding their suppliers to be, uh, be a part of the same planning and information system. That is a really an open book thing where, where there's a very high, high degree of transparency uh, between the, the, the production company and, and the suppliers. And it's a long story. I mean, you can also discuss whether that causes uh, specific problems. And the answer is, of course, yes. If you are tied up with one customer by sharing all the information with one customer, then you really need to, be, to make sure that that customer will, be, will also be uh, buying your products tomorrow. If not, you may not want to share information, you may perhaps start to, to, to cheat, and so on. So that's one reason why the Japanese, many Japanese car, uh, or car makers have been very focused on long-term relationships, mutual investments in, uh, in information systems and production facilities and research and development all of which are kind of sunk costs. They are, the costs are tied to that relationship. So it binds the parties together. And that is nice as long as the car maker mo makes money. But if that system collapses, then you have the same situation as the, <laughs> as the shipbuilding industry in the Eastern Norway some 20 years, 30, 30 years ago, when a lot of, uh, of people lost their jobs because when the shipyards went, a lot of, uh, of activities went uh, along with them. Whereas the Americans, they have more focus on, uh, on using the market, uh, using the competition in the market and not working directly with their suppliers. And they are applying a quite different uh, philosophy when it comes to, to vertical integration. Um, activities. Each and every one of them, of these, are complex. I mean, forecasting demand, complex. In some cases, when you deal with standard products, when you can collect data over a long period of time, and you can uh, run uh, a regression analysis when you explain demand based on business cycles and uh, prices and prices of competing products and everything. Then you can, you can make forecasts that are basis for planning, production planning in the short run, uh, facility management, capacity building in the longer run, transport, distribution networks, and so on. Whereas in other markets, you don't know much about demand. I mean, if you, if you try to forecast the demand for uh, fashion, clothing, suits and dresses and things like that, which are high fashion, you can sell one, item or you can sell a lot. You don't know. And then you can, uh, you can approach that in, in various ways. You can, as I said, have option agreements which may or may not be, uh, be, uh, be put into effect. Or you may have a lot of product variants so that in total even if the demand for various products are, uh, are uh, fluctuating, in total the demand is fairly stable. You may have a high turnover of, of the variants, so that the, the, sta the, the demand over time is rather st uh, stable. So you can, you can plan capacity, number of shops, uh, number of movements, and so on. One uh, famous, rather famous uh, quasi-fashion fa uh, chain like Zara is, is working like this. With high turnover of product var variants, but uh, 
in sum, the, the, the demand is possible to forecast. So, supply selection. Uh, I cannot go into detail on, on every, everything here, but, but it goes without saying that this is a, a rather important and, and demanding task. Ordering material is perhaps... Uh, it is, of course, linked with demand uncertainty. The same with this one and this one. Shipping and delivery has to do with, uh, with, uh, with demand, but also with segmentation of, uh, of customers and the level of service connected to, uh, to transportation, as we have talked about. And this one <coughs> has to do with uh, what I mentioned about this, uh, this uh, collaboration case in Stockholm and other places, profit sharing. Complex. This is a well-known illustration from uh, from Lambert Cooper and Parg, Croxton, 1997, 2001, uh, showing the focal firm, the suppliers in two different tires, the, the further upstream supplier and the next step in the supply chain. You have the focal firm. And you have two levels of, uh, of customers on this side, downstream. Within each company, the manufacturing company, you have different business processes. Purchasing, logistics in terms of movement of goods and, and, uh, and uh, items, marketing and sa sales, finance, research and development, and of course production. And you find the same <coughs> business processes at the suppliers and at the customers. So what, what this uh, illustration says is that you need to coordinate the business processes. Ideally, you need to coordinate them throughout the supply chain. And these are some of the, some of the functions that you need to coordinate. Customer relationships, service, demand, management, where you can use prices to, to, uh, to influence demand. Order fulfillment, <coughs> that, uh, that you have uh, supplies and, and everything flows through the, through the system. Manufacturing, uh, supply relations, product development and commercialization depends on the, uh, on the nature of the supply chain. I mentioned some chains where they just buy off the shelf, whereas in other chains they need to develop products and the returns. And you have the information flow on top here, communicating what is going on. Let's say at the end customer side, the demand, demand fluctu fluctuations, uh, what happens here when it comes to, uh, let's say, uh, unforeseen events like disruptions and so on, need to be com communicated and, uh, and it needs to be taken care of if something happens here that affects this manufacturing flow, for instance. It may affect this also. It may even affect demand management and so on. So this is a, a very commonly used uh, illustration of, uh, of supply chain management. Easy to, relatively easy to, to understand the logic in this, but it's very hard to do in practice. And that's why in many cases you have a tight relationship between the manufacturer and the first tire upstream, the supplier, and the first tire downstream, the customer. And then you leave it to the supplier here to take care of the su supplies further upstream. Because it's, I mean, if you, you can easily construct a, a supply chain with a lot of tires upstream. You can start with a, with a steel plant 
and go on downstream to until you get a, a, a semi-manufactured product that is used in the production process here, and you have a lot of of, uh, of tires. So often you are limited to sort of having the, the relationship with the first tire on both sides of uh, of your your company. Yes, this is uh, just a very simple illustration of what we call the bullwhip effect in, uh, in, uh, in supply chain management. And this has to do with, with, uh, with uncertainty and um, perhaps also uh, deficiencies in quality, production quality. So <coughs> the sequence goes like this. You need to produce 1,000 units, but you order a bit more of, of, uh, of a given supply or a given component to make sure that everything works. And here you see at once that, uh, that uh, quality matters. Reliability and quality matters. But <coughs> they order 5% more than they strictly need to produce the cars just to make sure that everything works. And they also orders a bit more to be sure that everything works and so on. So what you, what you end up here is that upstream then we have the first tire, the second and the third tire upstream. You end up ordering 20% more than you need to if the quality had been 100% all the way. So, <coughs> um, small deviations, they are accumulating to become rather big upstream in the supply chain. And this is why you have focus on um, quality management and, and everything, and also demand uncertainty because uh, you can translate this to demand uncertainty. You order more because you may, just in case anybody needs more than expected, and then you get the same effect. Uh, so that's why we try to focus on information flow and also to focus on pull systems that nothing happens before an order is placed. So this is, uh, let's say, an old-fashioned production facility where they make to, they make to stock. They produce 1,000 cars and they hope to sell them within the next month or so, right? Whereas in, in more modern systems, you won't order anything until the order is placed. So that is a, a very important principle difference. Yeah, this is uh, more or less said already. Um, I just want to mention one thing, and that is uh, that is connected to power. Power in the supply chain. Because uh, there may be uh, a build-up of power in certain uh, industries, like, for instance, in the in the food food retailers in uh, in uh, in countries like U.S. and Norway and and the U.K. <coughs> they have gained quite a lot of power over the manufacturers and wholesalers, so they can dictate more or less what kind of products, what kind of, uh, and, and they are very, very hard on negotiating pri prices. And that may, may uh, cause some, uh, some issues. Uh, like for instance, a very limited product variety. You get the same everywhere. And, uh, and if they gain power, they can also use that market power to keep newcomers out of the market. 
because they get so big, they have a such an economy of scale in their uh, in their uh, production. So uh, newcomers, they are not necessarily able to to cope with that. Counteracting forces are uh, can be uh, mitigating this, like uh, like internet sales, and also. Uh, a general growth in wealth can also be a counteracting force. Because if people, I mean, product variety is what we call an income elastic phenomenon. If you earn more, if you get more wealthy, uh, empirical evidence shows that you are demanding more sophisticated products. You want more fancy food, more fancy clothing, more fancy cars. And that is also a counteracting force towards market concentration. Because simply the willingness to pay for, uh, for uh, tailor-made products may pave the way for new, new products and new players in, uh, in, uh, in this market. I'm very wor worried about the Norwegian retailer uh, business when it comes to to uh, food I mean if s some of you are uh, are perhaps from from abroad and you may have seen the well if I compare with Italy or France uh, I'm not too impressed about the variety of uh, of brands and uh, and the food in in Norwegian food stores and that has a reason. Yeah. All right. Uh, this has been said. Uh, distribution trends. Um, talked about this. That there is a diversified picture when it comes to the level of service in the, in, uh, in the transportation business. Uh, and it's important to be aware of the needs, the end customer needs for, for a differentiated uh, transportation service, the, the speed delivery and, and things like that. Uh, <coughs> yeah. to, to, uh, to keep up the service level and this is uh, something that we will spend more time on later on in the course, network design to create distribution and network based on trade-offs between costs and the sophistication of the distribution system. Lower costs, like the China in the case I mentioned when, uh, when they tried to fill the container ships in, uh, in China, is one example of the trade-off between costs and level of service. Um, this is um, just a, an example of how logistics costs connected to the transportation and distribution part of the supply chain has been categorized in transport, own transport and least transport, loading and unloading, inbound, outbound bound and internal. Please note that already in the heading there is a trade-off between own or leased transport. If you own your transport, you have, um, you have to cope with capital costs, depreciation costs and everything. If you lease, you have to pay of course for the, both the capital and the depreciation and the uh, other operating costs but you may gain flexibility. You may gain flexibility. So if you have a very fluctuating demand, leasing may be a very good strategy to, to, uh, to hedge against uh, uncertainty in, in demand. Because if you own the vehicles yourself, you are also left with the risk. And, and the trade-off there depends on the uncertainty and the risk premium that you have to pay. Warehousing is, uh, is also a cost component. The same trade-off there. 
and, and uh, cost components connected to these elements, handling equipment, payroll expenses, wages, and so on. So, so we have the capital costs tied up or uh, freed up if you, if you go for a leasing. Uh, obsoleteness and wastage. Uh, things may break or things may become obsolete. Maybe uh, you can translate that to outdated. Actually, during the pro production process, it, they may become outdated, like uh, have been. There are some examples of that in the in the computer industry. Before they changed changed to a very order or pull driven production structure. Insurance is a cost. Pack packaging is a cost, and the administration is a cost. And um, this is a cost that also can be outsourced. This can be outsourced to third-party logistics providers that takes care of everything, at a cost, of course. But it gives you, as a production or manufacturing company, some degrees of freedom, flexibility. And, uh, and the trade-offs here needs to be uh, analyzed. I'm supervising a, a master thesis now that deals with the trade-offs between uh, leasing and owning uh, connected to transport of specific uh, products. So qu quite interesting. Here, just to wind up uh, a few slides on, on, uh, on logistic costs. The blue, the blue bars here are, are transport. These are warehousing. And you see the, the variance uh, or the variation between different sectors here manufacturing, wholesale, construction, and so on. And these are the logistics cost as the percent of turnover. You remember 10% in the US? Here it varies between some 12 and up to 15 point something percent for, for wholesale, which is uh, a business that is uh, dependent of, upon transport and, and warehousing to a large extent. So this is just to show you uh, some, some numbers. Here is an international comparison. Uh, Nor Norway is not uh, the worst in the class here. Around, uh, say, some 12%, 13% of the turnover. Whereas Germany has a rather high, high uh, cost, uh, has a rather high cost level of some 20%. And this, this difference should not be overinterpreted because it may be due to, or it is, we know that, it's due to uh, differences in the industry structure. Germany has a lot of, uh, lot of car industry, uh, which uh, has different demands for, uh, for uh, inventory and transport than, than others. So you see that uh, warehousing costs are, uh, are uh, a big, big part of the picture here. But to just collect the information and to try to, to separate the cost component into various uh, into components that are relevant for decisions and that can be analyzed is very important to be able to, uh, to improve the efficiency. So perhaps here Something could be done with this one in important German industries. I don't have the answer to that, but it's, it's very uh, helpful to have the, have the information at hand. So the summary here is, uh, is, uh, consists of a few points. Understanding the true costs, focusing on eliminating variability in transit times, uh, tariff engineering, uh, this has to do with customs, regulations and so on. Uh, consolidation, trade-off between consolidation and, uh, and uh, less than container load transports, if speed is needed. Uh, informed decision making, make the numbers transparent so that, uh, that you can um, 
you can, uh, for instance, make correct trade-off between uh, inventory and, and transport. Uh, automate compliance processes. Uh, that has to do with border crossings and the customs and the regulations again. And this is the last one. Avoid express shipping costs if they are not a part of the product. If the customer is willing to pay for the express, it's okay. But if you use express to compensate for deficiencies in the production process, it's just costs, it's waste. And you should try to avoid it by, by improving the, the processes. Okay. This was it for today. <laughs> uh, thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, next week we will uh, continue with the international logistics. Thank you.